Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Idrath Kor Irol Sazir, Northbridge. And as you can see, as always, the fortress is going very well. At this moment, it is the 7th of Malachite, midsummer of 110, making it our second year here. And as you can see down in the fortress, we're actually just finishing up a trade with the humans who have returned this year with everything we asked for last year, too. And if you remember what that entails, then you should be excited, because we certainly are. Let's have a gander down in our new subterranean pasture. Ah, yes, and there we have it. You can see here we have a pair of elephants. Elephants of our own. We can finally start competing with those damn elves and humans. <laughs> it's not just a two, either. No, no. I think we managed to get five of them. Males and females. So I'm willing to bet we're going to have a large elephant herd before very long, assuming we could feed all of them. And as well, I suppose if we can't feed them, then they'll feed us. <laughs> kind of dark, but I mean, just being realistic. I think they'll be fine, though. We're just going to leave them down here grazing on this floor fungus for now. I know it's not the prettiest pen down here, but I think it'll get the job done absolutely fine. Anyways, I just got really excited about that. Um, back to the fortress. Yes, as I was saying, fortress is going very well. Midsummer right now, starting in on our, you know, I think I misspoke earlier. We're starting our third year now. Time flies, huh? I'll tell you. Our population at this current time is 75 dwarves. With a mixed bag of happiness, it's uh, kind of cut down the middle at the moment. And that's probably due to how much work we've had to get done up on the bridge. Overall, this has been a very, very busy fortress. And that's not always for the best. We're making great progress, but it's come at a cost. Gonna have to rectify that somehow. But at the moment, there's just far too much work to do. Maybe we could take a little break at some point, though. Might have to. But not right now. In fact, you know, I'm sure you can already tell there's some pretty interesting things going on in the fortress these days. And so let's have a look, a uh, quick rundown of our current projects. First and foremost, our bridge, starting to be pretty well traveled by the dwarves. We're getting used to it, which is nice. Here's the ground floor, as you've seen it before. Moving up, we can see the trade depot level. Got some minor work there. And then up above that, that's where the interesting stuff's going on right now. Remember, this is where the meeting hall is going to be. And now you can see off, we have a... <laughs> four walkways leading off two to the west and two to the east and these are going to lead to bedrooms which are going to be underneath the walkways it'll become more clear with time you'll have to trust me and then if we have a look up from there you can see the top floor so far of the tower i think we're gonna have another level up above the meeting hall where we're gonna have like food storage and maybe kitchens and stuff that'd be a good place for it i think but we've only just started in on that it has a ways to go and then over this way here you can see what was our blacksmith area slash animal pasture area slash bell dropping area this whole place is kind of taken on a mind of its own these days as i'm sure you can see like of course you can see over here are animal pastures giant toads which are still pretty inactive and you can see that water is leaking in on their area there which i'm sure they don't mind but down here is where it's a problem because the giant mandrill and the jaguar probably don't really like so much water in their pen we could probably figure out something there though something like we've done over here actually this is going to be a farmer's guild hall it looks a little fancy doesn't it and it is it's very fancy it's made of jet stone but the walls are kind of leaky, which is a problem. And so you can see we've channeled out the area alongside the walls, and we put a bunch of grates in the way. And if you have a gander below ground, you can see this channel here we've dug, which will hopefully funnel all the water out into the bell dropping chamber, where it could just kind of spread out and eventually evaporate. But we shall see. Actually, having another look at the guild hall here, I don't think that's going to solve a blessed thing, because I'm seeing water dripping down from the ceiling above. Yeah, these grates are pretty ineffective. Uh, well, we'll figure it out. No big issue. Having a look over this way here, you can see yet another guild hall. This one's for the Rangers Guild. These are new groups that were just established for that last migrant wave. Just trying to make them as happy as they can. Give them a place off to the side. None of this stuff's going to be permanent in this area, I don't think. we got to move to the bridge, eventually. That being said, it has to be nicely appointed. Just to make them happy, you know? Anywho, up this way here, you can see where the real action's happening. We have our forges and our smelters and our metalsmiths' workshops and everything. We're very busy these days, making weapons and armor all out of iron. Now remember, I'm pretty sure we have the material to make steel here in the fortress somewhere. We just haven't found it yet. And we've done an awful lot of digging too. It must just be really deep down, looking for some sort of flux stone. So we, anyways, we can't make steel yet. And so we've been hard at work trying to make the best possible iron gear we can. Masterwork iron gear. It has not been easy. We are getting there though. Pretty sure that right at the moment we have eight masterwork spears. And you know, I'm not too sure about armor, but it's not looking great. We're trying our best though, of course. We've only made those spears because of Logum. He's a legendary weaponsmith. But we don't have anybody with even a moderate amount of proficiency with armor smithing in the fortress. We're trying to up the skill a bit with some of our dwarves, but it has not been easy. Ooh, hey, hey, hey. 
Looks like we have a new artifact that just popped out of the forges here. Let's have a look real quick. Eurist Logember, the blacksmith, has created Thestkig Sakrith, an iron armor stand. That's a symbol of our nation right there. And she offers it to the wealthy order, our fortress. Thank you very much, Eurist. This will go in a place of extremely high esteem. Your contribution is appreciated, my friend. Now then, let's have a closer look, shall we? Thestkig Sakrith translates to the conflagration of blazing and is worth 9,000, which is a considerable amount. Not too shabby. This is an iron armor stand. All craft ship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with oval jet cabochons and encircled with bands of walnut wood, rectangular praise cabochons, and single cut tiger eyes. This object is adorned with hanging rings of praise. On the item is an image of Akath Squidheel, the plump helmet man in iron. Akath Squidheel is dead. The artwork relates to the passing of the plump helmet man Akath Squidheel in the inky waters in the midwinter of 104. That's weird. The inky waters is the ocean that we are right next to. Gotta wonder how a plump helmet man died in that ocean. Or rather, underneath the ocean perhaps, in the tunnels. Hmm. Regardless, thank you, this is a wonderful item. Much appreciated, dearest. But yes, trying to figure out what other interesting things we have to touch on. And you know, that is something right there. I said earlier that we don't have anybody who knows how to make armor. But that's incorrect. We have a new dwarf here. Came in that last microwave, actually. Kind of a highfalutin dwarf from Nakortarad. The hero of Nakortarad is what she's called. Seems like quite the mover and shaker. I don't know what would have caused her to come down here, abandon her home where she's considered to be a hero. But she's here now. And she's a proficient armorsmith, and a weaponsmith, actually. Her name is Stackhud, and from what we understand, she's the one who founded that fortress up there, in a manner of speaking. They had a cyclops up in Nakortara that terrorized the place for quite some time, and apparently Stackhud here was living by herself in an abandoned fortress, essentially, and managed to pull through, and I guess those dwarves were able to slay the cyclops over time, but maybe it got a bit too busy up there. She doesn't really strike me as a dwarf who wants to stand out so much, and maybe being considered the local hero was a bit too much for her to bear. It's understandable, it's understandable. Well, we are happy to put your skills to use, my friend. Expecting good things. And just remember, um, you're the hero of Nakortarad. But this is Idrath Kor Irol Sazir, and here, you're just an armorsmith. Don't you go expecting any big accommodations, Miss Hero. Now get back to smithing those helmets. We want to see some masterpieces. Good luck. Well, let's hold up here a second. A disturbance in the mines. Enemies have been sighted. Oh, no. This is going to be our first real challenge, I think. Looks like we have a group of murderous amphibian men here. Amphibian people are generally evil creatures, resembling walking frogs with arms and the intelligence to use them. They live in the waters far under the earth. Absolutely beastly. Right at the moment, I can see seven of them. Luckily, though, they are a little bit smaller than a dwarf. And these ones here don't appear to be wearing armor, but it should be noted that they are wielding spears, and they all have shields, too, made of various kinds of metal, all no doubt scavenged from ancient crypts and tombs. Weapons like these could be deadly. Now, I'm actually a really concerned during this situation here, just because we have some of our dwarves in the area, civilians. The amphibian people aren't very far away at all, and the warriors have to travel a distance. They're on their way as we speak, but it's going to take them a bit. Anywho, let's watch here. The amphibian men are moving in slowly, trying to figure out our settlement here. They've never seen anything like it, I'm sure. Oh, here they come. Ah, uh, just one dwarf, actually. Zuglar, who's coming in by himself, and I don't think he has a spear either. Oh, yeah, he's just smashing straight into him, though. Completely surrounded. And yet... Oh, oh my goodness, he, he's killed several amphibian people all by himself as the other warriors come in. That was brutal right there. And there are more amphibian people coming. There must have been more out in the caves. But they are falling like nothing else. Turns out their flabby hides can't match up to our masterwork iron spears. <laughs> Just leaving piles of them behind. I see a couple of wounded dwarves in there. But we don't have to worry about these amphibian people, I don't think. That really wasn't so bad. Hey, there you go, dwarves. Zuglar, especially. My goodness, that was impressive, my friend. As for these poor wounded dwarves, I wish we had things set up better for them, but we do not right at the moment. We're trying to get a hospital set up down here in our mines right now. It will get the job done well enough. I just wish we had some soap or something to clean their wounds out. And actually, you know what? I'm not sure we even have access to fresh water for them. That's going to be a problem. We have to get that quickly. Luckily, though, we just had this dwarf here pop up in a microwave like a day ago. His name is Besmar. 
and he's a pretty decent doctor, so he's been made our chief medical dwarf. It's kind of a lot to be mantled with as soon as walking into a brand new fortress, but I think he's going to do fine. It's not like we have a choice anyways. Now, a little bit more on these dwarves, these wounded dwarves here who are laying in the floor and not in a bed. They just became soldiers right before the amphibian men attacked, and so it makes sense they didn't do very well in that combat. That being said, you know, we had to send out all of our warriors, so didn't really have much of a choice. That being said, they are now permanently wounded. They both suffered some pretty terrible back injuries in that fighting, and I don't believe they can stand anymore. Because they haven't died yet, I think they're going to pull through ultimately, but they're not going to make great warriors anymore. And because they lost the ability to function to a full capacity, we're going to make them kind of like honored souls in the fortress, just because they received these wounds while defending the fortress. It's kind of important that we take care of them correctly. And we're going to make a habit of that too here in Northbridge. Anybody who receives grievous wounds that takes them out of combat permanently is going to become one of the honor wounded. We'll try to get them great accommodations when it comes time to move onto the bridge. For now, just rest up, you guys. I'm hoping somebody puts you in a bed, but um, I guess for now, you'll just have to make do on the floor. <laughs> Anywho, we'll check back in at some point. Back up in the fortress now. While our little amphibian man scuffle happened, the dwarven traders arrived. It is autumn now, and we have completed our trade already. That being said, we really didn't get all too much. We've been doing so many good trades that we haven't been managing to produce as much as we would like. And uh, another worrying thing is that we don't well, we really don't have as much platinum as I would have thought we would. Just, you know, you know, like one of our first steps here was making an enormous platinum bell. So that would lead you to believe that we had an awful lot of platinum. And I guess we did at one point, but we used kind of all that platinum to make crafts, which we've then traded. The trade that took place here today mostly consisted of uh, amphibian man spears and shields. And in turn, we got a bunch of food. Seems to be our usual trade item. We got some clothes too, nothing fancy. But it does seem a shame. I wish we can get our hands on some more valuable metals around here. Just gonna have to do some more digging, I think. Which, you know, is kind of crazy to say, because we've done an awful lot. Just to give you an idea what our minds are looking like these days. Here, let's go through them, starting at the bottom. Yeah, they're pretty spacious, aren't they? Sprawling, one could say. Even beyond that, like, we've been making all those rooms for dwarves and stuff underground. You know, come to think of it, I don't even know where we found that platinum at the start. Maybe we just stumbled across one good vein and didn't realize it. Just assumed there was a lot more to come. Seems a shame, doesn't it? We'll find more eventually, though. Not too, too concerned about it. Yeah, it's a lie, actually pretty concerned. <laughs> It'll be fine though. It'll work its way out. We haven't had problems yet with stuff to trade, so we'll just have to keep hoping for Idrath's blessings, I guess. Now then, back to the fortress. Here you can see the metal crafting level once again. Or I suppose that's how we know it as, which doesn't really have a name. There's all kinds of stuff going on in here. Regardless, what we're doing mainly these days is producing just an awful lot of armor. But most of the time, it's not uh, good enough. It's not good enough at all. We want masterwork stuff. Anything less will not cut it. And so if it's not up to our standards, we just melt it back down and use those bars to make new armor. That's one type of metal we have no lack of here is iron. We have so much iron. It's kind of ridiculous. Our smiths are getting a good amount of skill too, so that's great. And actually, I think we just produced our first masterwork breastplate, which surprisingly is our first masterwork piece of armor. And it was made by the glorious hero of Nokortorad, Stackud. Good job there, Stackud. Really striving to prove yourself to the fortress, aren't you? Well, keep it up. You're doing some fine work. I'll note too that we've given her her own workshop. All of our main smiths have their own workshops now. Except Stackud's is on the end. Uh, it seems to be infested with spiders too. There's always dead spiders in there. Killed by her pet, Kitten. She does have a kitten. His name's Olan and he came with her from Nokortrad. He's been pulling his way around here so far, killing all those spiders. Oh, and you know, I should also note that Stackud came here with a friend of hers from Nokortrad. Thigh-cut, a former woodcutter. We have her doing all kinds of stuff now. And in fact, she just made a statue for us. A masterwork statue. It seems she has a lot of skill with stone crafting. Anyways, the statue she made was of Vabok. And yes, it is a stunning piece. We're thinking of putting it in Vabok's quarters. You know, if I didn't know better, I would think Thigh-cut's trying to ingratiate herself to Vabok on Stackhut's behalf. Not necessary, though. You're both doing fine work here, and you're fitting in very well. Heroes, both of you. Sure. <laughs> Anywho, keep it up, you two. Now then, where were we? Ah, uh, yes. Down over this way here, you can see the Farmer's Guild Hall. It's all done now. Completely made of jet. We have jet statues in there, jet workshops, jet tables, chairs, and those grates, of course. And it did end up working out pretty darn well, too. Because now water drips down on the sides and makes a nice cooling mist every once in a while. It's working out very well. 
probably one of the best appointed chambers in the entire fortress, honestly. And you know, you're probably wondering why we put so much time and attention into this one room here. And that's because Aitan is a farmer, Vabok's girlfriend. So when we set up this chamber, you know, he knew that she liked Jet, and maybe he went a bit overboard here. But you know, I'm sure she appreciates it. All the farmers do, of course. Over this way here, you can see the uh, less well-appointed Ranger's Guild Hall. Rather, you know, that's not true. This room here is actually uh, better for a dwarf. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's only the four statues, five thrones, and then the two doors. They're all made out of brimstone sulfur. So it's a little smelly in here, a little bit. Now, it's not a bad chamber by any means, but it's not quite an appropriate guild hall. And so, like, we, we didn't really want to clutter the place up with all kinds of cabinets and more statues and stuff. And we ran out of brimstone, so we kind of throw off the whole design the motif. So we just put that armor stand in here. We figured that'd get the job done. And it certainly has. That's the Keg Sakrith, the one that we had just made earlier. It's a fantastic piece, and the Rangers really appreciate seeing it. Plus, it keeps it out of harm's way. Gotta make sure those Crag children don't run off with it. Those mischievous little bastards. Actually, you know what? Give me a second here. There we have it. That's a little bit more nicely arranged, isn't it? They can see the armor stand from every angle. Perfect. Oh, crap. Up here on the surface, it looks like somebody just noticed some goblin snatchers. A trio of them. They've come armed with leather bags, seeking to steal away our children once again. The creeps. Uh, I'm just gonna watch them. They've been spotted, they know they're spotted. But they don't seem to have any interest in running away, quite yet. Yeah, that's not great at all. In addition to their bags, they also have large knives, which they could do a serious amount of damage with. Look at these ballsy bastards. Get out of here, will ya? Uh, getting a little scuffle here with the dwarves. They're just trying to get down in the fortress. Oh, crap. This bastard up here nabbed a child. They've got him in a bag, and they're trying to get away now, I believe. Oh, you creep. The Salt Bridge squad is on the way. And I'm hoping they run into those other goblins on the way to this one here. We're making this one our prime concern. And this idiot doesn't even know where they're going. It's just assuming there's another way out, I think. Yeah, just hoping those warriors can make their way here. Oh, here they come. Okay. Go get them, Godin. Skewer them. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay, you're free, kid. Get out of here. Ooh, that was a close call. Of course, there are others, too. I think this one here is trying to escape now. If they're smart, that's what they'd be doing. Of course, no, they're coming back. You idiot. All our dwarves up here are terrified running around. Oh, yeah, you're not getting out of here, are you? Geshud's chasing this one down. Get him, Gesh. <laughs> there you go. Skewer him up. Cool, that's two down. And it looks like the third was just dealt with. Down here in the mines. Well, that's great. Excellent work, dwarves. Kind of a close call that time. The goblins seemed more coordinated. Dangerous, dangerous. We'll have to, uh, maybe set up some danger zones or something. Places where civilians can't go, you know? Maybe keep us more clustered together. We probably should be doing that, just for safety's sake. We'll put some thought into it. <gasps> Gashad, you fool! Oh, that's not good at all. Looking back up to the surface, I think Gashad was a bit wound up after that goblin combat there, and he went and took down this poor kobold. It'll be a thousand years bad luck in the fortress. Right over here next to the shrine, too. Oh, no, that's... That does not bode well. I'm hoping it was an accident. I'm sure it was. You know, we don't have many interactions with the Crag children. Maybe he just got a... I don't know. Just, uh, he was confused. I don't really blame the guy, but... Oh, yeah, that's not good. Gashad, I'm sorry, but... You're gonna need a little bit of shunning after that, I think. We don't have any nicknamed dwarves here in the fortress yet, but... I think you're gonna be our first with the nickname Curse Crag. Maybe we can rectify this somehow. I mean, we've already made offerings to the kobolds, though it doesn't look like any of them have been taken. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's that's very bad for us. And you know what makes sense, too? We were able to get that goblin before it ran away with our child, probably because the kobold was here. We were being actively blessed with good luck. And Geshot here went and mucked it up. Old curse crag. The hell you doing? Yeah, I see you trying to desperately chase down this black bear for the fortress. I don't think it's going to cut it, though, my friend. Though it is a start. Oh, be more careful in the future, please. Curse Crag. And you know, while we're talking about nicknamed warrior dwarves, I was revisiting the cavern carnage from that amphibian battle, and I counted 15 dead amphibian people still laying here in the caves. 15? That's pretty impressive. A little terrifying, but mostly impressive. And you know what's really impressive is Zuglar over here, the first warrior that got to combat, remember? Zuglar was able to kill seven of those 15 amphibian people all by himself. And he did have a spear, actually. I thought he didn't have one. It didn't look like he had one, but maybe he just had it tucked away or something. Still though, seven amphibian people. When he was completely surrounded too, remember? It's kind of amazing, actually. And as such, I think he's got a nickname too. 
Frog Stomp. <laughs> Certainly memorable. Good job once again, Frog Stomp. Keep it up. And you know, I'd like to do something else to commemorate the event, too. The dwarves have been calling it the first Battle of the Caves. Assuming there'll be more, I guess. I'm sure there will be, but yeah, it's kind of taken a life of its own. As such, we've carved out this little chamber down here, and, well, we're just gonna get nicened up real quick. Just kind of like a, a mini museum memorial or something. We have a lot of dwarves up on the surface right now. Actually, the water has frozen up there, and so, as usual, they're getting supports on the bridge. So we're gonna keep this project relatively quick, but as you can see, it's not taking all too long. I'm trying to use up some of this extra stone that we've had lying around. Microcline for this project here. Got some nice blocks on the floor the walls, and some statues too. Four statues of terrified amphibian men, and one of a Zuglar frog stomp, just right in the middle like that. There we go, that's a nice little place, isn't it? And now of course, it's not gonna be a permanent fixture down here, but we can move all the statues out, move the blocks out, and just remake this chamber on the bridge when it's when we've got a place for it. Soon I'm hoping, but we shall see. For now, this will suffice. Having a look out at the bridge now, primarily at this southern tower, the one that leads underground. Remember, we had done a bunch of the walls here with wood, just as a temporary measure to keep the ocean out. And right now, we're trying to get those replaced with stone, proper stone, conglomerate stone. We've been using a lot more conglomerate than claystone these days, almost going 50-50 with it. But regardless, as you can see, we've made a bunch of stairways down around this tower, and we have removed all the wooden walls. We're just getting those blocks in place now. It's, uh, it's, uh... A little harrowing, but it looks like we're getting it done, no problem whatsoever. This winter is zooming right on by, and I can't wait to show you our progress. We've done a lot. But first, looking at this tower uh, down a little bit now that we have those walls in place, I would like to do those upper floors like these ones here and get some nice floors laid out, spread out through these layers just so it's not a treacherous spiral staircase that leads all the way down. Like you can see these floors down here. These ones are all set. And actually down this way here is where we have our barracks. I figured it would be a better place for it, especially since we've been harassed by those amphibian people down in the caves. This is a nice midpoint between the caves and where our dwarves have been, so it's getting the job done well enough. The fortress layout is pretty spread out these days. So it's gonna be tough if danger pops up in a far-flung area, you know, but yes, this will again suffice for now Anywho, oh hey a little surprise right there. Looks like Northbridge has another artifact Wonderful. I didn't even know it was being created so much stuff going on these days Zuglar Lycotning a miner has created a Roth Rubal a bituminous coal coffer He offers it to the wealthy order. Okay. Okay. Interesting not generally a type of material that we consider to be masterwork grade, but I'm sure it's amazing nonetheless. Let's have a closer look, shall we? Aroth Rubal translates to magic gills. It's worth 2,500, not bad. This is a bituminous coal coffer. All craft dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is decorated with fungi wood. On the item is an image of Athel Great Tours the Dwarf in bituminous coal, as well as an image of three dwarves in lignite. And there's also an image of Mestos Glidegold the Dwarf in bituminous coal. Fascinating item. Athel Great Tours is our king, our current reigning king, and Mesthos Glygold is a baron of Chasm Mind. Not that this piece mentions it, but Athel and Mesthos were both present at the Assault of Incineration, which occurred in Copper Dots in 104. Maybe this has something to do with that. Very interesting bit of a political piece, a bit of our history here. Fascinating. We will get this stored away, and thank you very much for your contribution. We will make sure no fire gets near it, because I'm sure it would go up like nothing else. Joking, of course. We'll keep it safe. Thank you. Okay, back outside. Right now it's the 9th of Obsidian. 10th of Obsidian. And the 11th. And there we have it, the tremendous spring thaw. The ice reverts back to its watery form once again. Now that I'm sure you can see it already, I've been extremely excited to show off this little bit right here. This little, um, well, you can see right here a couple of pillars, but if we move upwards, oh, did you see that? It's an arch. It took us forever to make this. Looking pretty brilliant, I'd say. A little entryway to our bridge. I think it came out pretty nice. This is what we've been spending so much time on. Very difficult. I'm just kidding, of course. This is nothing. <laughs> just a little side project. You can see all these dwarves here walking over to our bridge, though. That's where the real show is. Let's go have a look, see what they're doing. How about that right there, huh? I think our bridge fortress is coming right along, wouldn't you say? As you can see, there is the heart of the bridge, the entryway. Pretty much as you saw it last. And then, of course, we have the southern tower there. Very well traveled these days. But then off on the sides, you can see all those little chambers. Right now, you can see eight of them completed. There's also two more over to the side, just starting in on those. But if we move up, well, you can see our trade depot level, as well as eight more rooms off on the sides of the bridge. And if we move up once again, you can see those four walkways that we were starting in on. Those are all done now. And that's how the bedrooms are going to be accessed. Now, 
I know this is not an efficient setup at all, but it's glorious, that's for damn sure. Each bedroom is going to be 10 spaces, all fully furnished too. It's going to be one hell of a project to get it all done, but we are going to get it done. No worries there. It's going to take a bit, but we're patient. Anyways, let's move up from here. Right here, you can see the kitchen level, right above where the meeting hall is going to be. Not quite done yet, but you can see we've started on a floor. That's coming right along. It's going to be accessed from this stairway down here, down to the south. Nice, spacious stairway. And if we move up from here, you can see the walls shrink in a little bit more. But it is, again, accessed from that southern stairwell. Floor is not finished yet. But this here is going to be the library, I think. Library or maybe a museum, maybe a combo, I don't know. Something like that. I figured it best if these three chambers are all kind of linked up. The kitchen, library, museum, all attached directly to the meeting hall, you know? The beating heart of Northbridge. It's gonna work out pretty well, I think. Now, above this, we don't really have any plans as of this current moment. But what I'm thinking we could do, just because there is an awful lot of space up here, is either make more bedrooms up here for civilian dwarves, or possibly we could make it a suite for the nobles. Vabok could use a nice place up here. We could partition it up so he has an office, a dining room, bedroom, plenty of space. That might work out pretty well. And then just take it up from there level by level. But I'm not too sure. Still figuring things out. That being said, we have a pretty good idea what some bedrooms are going to look like. These here are a couple of bedrooms for our honor wounded. The two who were taken out of the military earlier. And you can see they're very well appointed. We're going to do this for every dwarf's bedroom, but we figured we'd give bedrooms to these two first. They definitely deserve it. On the left, you can see a bedroom for Avaz, who, by the way, is getting around very well with a crutch these days. He has a bunch of nice furniture in there, as well as a masterwork bed and a statue of a gorilla riding a cow two animals that he's a big fan of. And he has some green glass windows too. That's a material that he's a big fan of. It gets the job done nicely, that's for sure. And over on the right is Doosim's bedroom. He's also getting around very well on a crutch. And he too also has a masterwork bedroom and a bunch of claystone furniture. He's a, he likes the color brown, so we figured we could do that much for him. He has some gray chalcedony windows in his room. Not that he's a fan of it or anything, but it's a pretty nice quality material. His statue portrays himself holding up a pond turtle. That's one of his favorite animals. Yes, these are a couple of very nice bedrooms, and the Honor Wounded seem to really enjoy them. It's going to be a lot of work to get all the rooms done like this, but again, we're going to try our best. Uh, also note that we have the windows pointed outward. We didn't want them pointed in at the bridge. I mean, I guess we still could, but that ocean view would probably be a little bit more scenic, you know? I'm a little concerned about dwarves looking out and seeing invaders or something in the future. They wouldn't be able to use their bedrooms too effectively, but we still might try that. I'm not sure. We'll play it by ear. Having a look at the date right now, we are sailing straight through spring, and with springtime comes the elves. Yes, they're here trading right now as we speak. This year, they really didn't bring all too much of interest. Of course, really, the only thing they could have brought was a giant mandrill, a mate for our one down underground. But no, no such luck. Just a bunch of plants, so we were able to trade some iron armor. We didn't tell them that we burned a lot of trees in order to make it. They didn't seem to mind, though. And yeah, we got a lot of food, so it worked out. That being said, and speaking of trees, we did have another meeting with the elven diplomat. And I'd say it went over all right. They came in requesting that we only chop down uh, some 25 trees through the course of this entire next year. That's a bit restrictive. We were able to talk them up a bit, though. 50-something trees. I, I'd say that's pretty good, really. We've been cutting down trees, but I don't think we can cut down that much in a year. That's an awful lot. Besides, <laughs> I don't think there's that many trees left in our area. I think it'll be fine. I don't even think we have to keep track of how many trees we're cutting down. It'll work out, I'm sure. Looking to try to keep things as positive with the elves as we can. They do have a lot to offer. We have to admit that much. A lot of food. That's very important. Plus giant animals. You never know what you could find from them. Again, a mate for our giant mandrill would be excellent. Maybe one day. You never know. The rat bastards. Anywho, back over here to our beautiful bridge project. Would you believe me if I said that we only just started making these rooms off to the sides less than a year ago? Maybe about eight months ago or so. It really hasn't taken all that long, which is just great to see. Yeah, we are busting straight through this whole thing. Again, make no mistake, it's going to take quite a bit more time still, of course. The way I figure it, it's taken us maybe nine months to do the whole body of the fortress here, as well as those walkways above, and 16 bedrooms. So, if we're not doing so much work on the actual fortress itself, I would think we could pump out 16 bedrooms every six months or so, 32 in a year. It's not terrible. The only thing is space. We're going to have to figure out where we're going to put all these things. That's going to be the problem, but not a big problem. We could take care of that. Not an issue at all for us. The dwarves of Idrathkor, I roll Sazir. Northbridge. Wealthiest fortress in the north. Actually, you know what? We're going to get started moving in promptly. If you have a look up here, you can see our kitchens and food stockpiles. 
good to go. Plenty of storage. Meeting hall's looking good too. Got tables, got chairs, plenty of space. Right at the moment, the dwarves do have to travel quite a bit to get to their bedrooms, but we're hoping to remedy that soon. Starting with maybe uh, the angrier dwarves in the fortress. Got to keep that happiness as high as we can. Currently, we have a population of 105 dwarves. We have 27 who are on the positive end of the spectrum in terms of happiness right now, 30 who are in the middle, and 48 who are towards the negative end of the spectrum right now. That is not good. Plus, six of those dwarves are really getting pissed these days. But I'm hoping to turn things around in short order. We have to remember, dwarves, the future looks bright. This work will pay off, my friends. By Idrat's gold, it will. And with that, we're going to start talking about some behind-the-scenes things. Again, this is the part of the episode where we start talking about some, you know, well, behind-the-scenes things, I guess it's redundant to say. But, you know, just going over some of my design choices and whatnot. I have to say, in this episode right here, man, it was an awful fun time planning out everything. I have seen quite a few people griping about the Steam version. I've seen more positive words than negative, but, you know... Truth be told, I was on the fence for quite a bit in the lead up to the Steam version coming out. Just, you know, the hemming and the hawing. Ooh, well, my, my imagination is not going to work anymore if I see the pictures. You know, it's it's fine. It's obviously fine. And seeing everything on screen moving around with the graphics just, I don't know, it works really, really well. I don't find that seeing the graphics disturbs my imagination in the slightest. I mean, as you could probably tell by the weird purple fox rat looking goblins, you know. You know, I, I was actually thinking about it, and, like, one of my concerns originally with the Steam version coming out and the graphics was, like, you know, the ASCII makes such a imagination-friendly sort of environment. You know, you have to imagine things, or else it's just little ASCII images on the screen, right? Of course, that, that's what a lot of people's fears were, and, and that's what a lot of people still don't like about the graphics, I guess. I'm not gonna say a lot of people, that's what some people still don't like about the graphics. Anyways, the graphics as they are right now, like... I guess I realized that I've been playing games like this ever since my childhood, like back in, you know, like when I was playing the NES or something. Like when you're playing Legend of Zelda on the NES, say, I don't think I'm playing as a highly pixelated little swordsman, you know, walking around hitting highly pixelated little spider things and Octoroks and whatnot. No, I, I picture things like, you know, fully fleshed out, like how they had in the comics and stuff. There was Nintendo Power Comics, or, you know, just Nintendo Comics, produced by Valiant, I believe. But, like, that's how I would picture things, you know? <laughs> or, like, when, with Mario, right? Like, I don't think I'm playing as a highly pixelated little plumber jumping around killing Goombas and whatnot. At the same time I was playing these games, I would watch, like, you know, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. And so I would be well aware that the stuff in the game isn't necessarily representative of what they actually look like. I mean, obviously, right? That's obvious. And I would draw pictures of Mario and Koopa Troopas and whatnot, you know, doing their thing. That's kind of what I'm doing here, you know? Like, I don't find my mind is totally twisted towards one direction just because the stuff on screen tells me it looks a certain way, you know? Especially if there's an actual written description of the stuff that's in the game. That's still what I rely on more than anything. The graphics is there as a better placeholder for what your imagination is supposed to do. But that written description is still where you're getting most of your information from, you know? Like one of the artifacts in the episode, you know, you get a hematite door. It's obviously not a red square. That's boring. You're gonna picture all that crazy crap hanging off of it, of course. I don't know, that's just where I'm coming from with it. Some people like the ASCII aesthetic, and you know, I'm one of those people, I like it. But I can appreciate this, too. Kinda harkens back to the Super Nintendo era, in my mind, which, you know, it's one of my favorite eras. A lot of old video game talk today. I'll tell you, old Krug Smash here? Big fan of old Nintendo stuff, that's for sure. Probably didn't think we'd be going off on such a Nintendo-based tangent today, but <laughs> here we are. I figure it helps give a little insight to the process, right? Anywho, let's see, what else do I have to talk about? In stark contrast to that last episode, I have not yet done any drawing for this one, so I don't know what kind of crazy things I'm gonna draw. I'm really excited to draw one of those amphibian people. And you know, actually, that's something I'm thinking about right here. I am at least partially influenced by the tile set in this case. I kind of like the way the amphibian people look, kind of. I'm not sure how far I'll lean into that, but I guess, you know, I can be influenced by the tile set. I think it's a pretty cute design for a little frog fish guy, you know? I think it's a suggestion of those fins on the sides of the head. Very retro chic, you know? Picturing like a creature from the Black Lagoon sort of a vibe. Yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll have to see how that one turns out. Uh, but yes, we are getting to the end here. And hey, you know what? There is something I'd like to discuss. 
with you specifically because you've made it to this far in the video. There's a way you could help me with this and it doesn't involve you giving me any money, so no worries there. For years now, the YouTube algorithm has not really been on my side. Hard to believe, I know, it doesn't favor Dwarf Fortress content for some reason. That being said, you know, there's still the power of word of mouth. I figure if you've gotten to this point in the video, it might be, I don't know, something you could be interested in. You know, share my videos with someone. One of your friends, maybe a family member or something. The power of word of mouth in this technological age should not be understated. It could still be quite handy. And it could be something that keeps me going for quite some more time. I really don't like shilling my own stuff at all, you know, like Patreon and whatnot. And I certainly don't like just promoting my stuff either, you know, like, hey, come look at what I'm doing over here. So, I mean, it kind of comes down to you guys in a way. I just couldn't imagine even if I were to like put an ad out for my videos, like it would do very well at all, you know. Truth be told, I've said it before, my uh, revenue had been going down for years up until the Steam release came out to the point where I was like, eh, maybe I should jump off this ship before it sinks fully, you know? But then the Steam release came out and now it's like, kind of like a uh, second wind in a way. But, you know, I figure I should make a suggestion like this just to make sure that, you know, I can continue doing it for many years. Kind of something I gotta do. I don't even like to put this on you, you know? But I want to keep doing this and I figure you want to keep watching. So let's work together, you know? I don't know. Thanks, if, you know, just for hearing me out at least. I appreciate it. Again, if you have some fan art you'd like to show off at the end of the episode right here, you can send it over to Krugsmash at gmail.com. Just be sure to give me a name you'd like to be called here, as well as a title for the piece if you want. And with that, I suppose we should wrap things up, eh? Thank you once again for watching today, my friend. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope to see you next time here in Idrath Kor Irol's Azir, Northbridge. And until then, you bearded bastards.